Welcome everyone. My name is Steve Meisick and I'm the host of live broadcasts at Rush University Medical Center. Today my guest is facial plastic surgeon Dr. Ryan Smith. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you Steve and thanks for everyone who is uh, listening in today. I hope um, I can help give some information about what I do here at Rush and then answer any questions that anyone has. So thanks for joining. Absolutely. So, yeah, and, and to that point, um, if we want to encourage anyone who has questions for Dr. Smith related to plastic surgery, they can share them in the comments of our Facebook Live, and we'll make time to ask a few of those at the end. So, to kick things off, tell us a little bit about your role here at Rush. Sure. So, here at Rush, I serve as an assistant professor in the section of facial plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, I also am the director of our Rush South Loop Otolaryngology or ENT group. Um, and so I decided to come back and join Rush actually after having trained here during medical school and residency. Um, I went to Baltimore at Johns Hopkins for advanced training in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, and then thought of no better place to come back than to join my colleagues at Rush, um, where currently we're working hard and um, able to provide many services to patients like yourselves who are listening. Great. And so it's been reported that a lot of people have been seeking out plastic surgery to improve their appearance on Zoom calls uh, as they've been stuck on during the pandemic. Are you seeing this phenomenon at Rush? And what can a plastic surgery surgeon like yourself do to help them? Absolutely, we're seeing that. I think even before COVID, we were seeing patients um, take time from themselves in a different manner to see cosmetic changes. And I think that there is no longer such a stigma about vanity and the um, kind of initiative to, to make these changes to our appearance. But certainly in the time of COVID, we have seen that to an even larger degree. I think so often when patients are working from home or they're doing uh, Zoom calls or on camera, they're noticing things about their appearance that probably have always been the case, but mm -hmm. because masks are giving only a small glimpse of the entire facial appearance, patients tend to key in on areas that they're noticing on camera, or at least they have uh, worries or uh, issues with their self-esteem when they see their image on screen. And so that really has led to a large uptick and patients that are finding me in my office to discuss, well, what are these things that I can do to approve, uh, improve the heaviness under my eyes or the dark circles that I see, even though I'm rested well and I'm feeling like I'm getting the best sleep uh, of all time, yet I'm still seeing these signs that, that I don't like to see when I look in the mirror. So sure. we know that this is a real phenomenon that people are perceiving and kind of paying attention to their facial appearance more than before. And I certainly think the ways that we're forced to communicate during the COVID uh, pandemic has, has led to a lot of patients, you know, finding, finding out where to go to, to start to ask the right questions and get help. And so to answer the second part of your question, where do I fit in? Well, I think the first thing and the most important thing is to sit down and to listen to patients and to hear what are their areas of concern? How long have these things bothered them? To what degree are they starting to affect um, somebody's self-esteem and their ability to feel and look, you know, like themselves? And so um, sitting next to a patient and listening to their concerns and hearing them out is absolutely the first step. And that, um, that often leads the discussion into more discrete areas that we can make a great improvement and, and really um, restore some of that self-esteem that maybe times of COVID have, have kind of compromised for some patients. And how do you determine what the best course of action is for someone once they've just, once they've brought an issue to you? Good question. Well, I usually like to let the patient direct the conversation. I'll usually hand the patient a hand mirror and I'll ask them simply to point to areas that they're looking for improvement because it isn't up to me to pinpoint and circle areas that I feel need improvement. Right. That doesn't do the patient any good. So instead, I have them direct me towards areas that they've noticed they would like to seek improvement. And once we've identified the areas of the face that we want to try to improve, 
that's when I like to discuss a host of different options for patients to consider because the truth is not everybody is looking for a surgical treatment. Not mm -hmm. everybody is looking for downtime that requires healing and uh, recovery. And so really starting with the most basic treatments, which might involve skincare, could involve injectables that can be done in five minutes in the office, and then leading all the way up to things that may have a greater overall improvement, such as facelift or rhinoplasty, but that also incur a little bit more downtime and perhaps a little bit more time healing. Um, all of those things are super important to discuss because the patient's motivation might be slight improvement and not a total overhaul of their facial appearance. And I would never want to assume that that's what they're looking for when I first meet them. So I think after we identify areas of improvement, then we can really discuss in detail every single option from the least invasive to maybe the more um, aggressive or more definitive treatments that we offer as well, which give great results. And that allows the patient and myself to settle somewhere in between where we find the exact right treatment and, and then can move forward and start discussing that in greater detail. Right. So you mentioned injectables um, when you were just talking there. Um, so there, I know there are different types of um, injectables. Let's start with dermal fillers. Can you tell me a little bit about dermal fillers and uh, if they're considered safe and effective? Yes, absolutely. Dermal filler is one of the most commonly injected uh, materials that plastic surgeons and especially facial plastic surgeons offer patients for improvement. And what dermal filler really is, is an ability to safely restore areas of volume that we all tend to lose in certain places of the face with time. So mm -hmm. sometimes that can be deep grooves that form. And, and I'll point to my own face just to demonstrate the lines that tend to form between the corner of the nose and down to the corner of the lips or mm -hmm. lines that form from the corner of the lips down to the chin. Sometimes as we age, we lose volume in those areas and those creases become deeper. They cast a shadow that might make somebody look older than they feel. And mm -hmm. what dermal filler is, is the ability to inject a material under the skin to restore that lost volume, to make the grooves or the creases less deep, and therefore overall restore a more beautiful appearance, a more youthful appearance, and a more rested appearance. Um, in terms of the safety profile of dermal filler, it is um, an extremely safe substance to have injected, meaning it is very inert. The body does not react to it or perceive it as foreign. There mm -hmm. are risks with any in-office injectable procedure. Right. And I think the most important thing to avoid any of those risks and to get a great outcome is to see a board certified plastic surgeon who has experience in injecting this type of dermal filler in these exact places. And there are techniques that are done in order to increase the safety profile and to avoid any of the risks that you might hear about from your surgeon before treatment or that you might read about when you do your own research online. So the um, experience of the person injecting and the areas and type of dermal filler used for the specific reason that we're choosing it, all of those things allow this procedure to be actually quite safe, very simple to do in terms of time spent in the office, and also reduce the downtime in terms of recovery for after treatment. Right. And <clears throat> another type of injectable, of which many people have heard of, of course, is Botox. Um, I wondered if you could please explain what it is, how it works, and how it differs from dermal fillers. I would love to because I hear every day from patients in the office who are looking into certain ways to improve their appearance that they almost consider them to be identical. And the truth is, is that they are vastly different substances and therefore they're used for completely different purposes. And um, to speak a little bit more about um, botulinum treatments, that is an injection that affects muscle. And instead of trying to restore volume, like we discussed with dermal filler injections, what botulinum injections do is they relax muscle. So those treatments are great at smoothing away wrinkles that form 
because as the muscle contracts, it almost folds the skin into a crease, which shows up as a wrinkle. And if we can relax the muscle that's folding the skin, we can prevent wrinkles from becoming apparent. So the most common places and the FDA approved uses of botulinum injections include the 11 lines that we all tend to form here. We also call those frown lines. The lines mm -hmm. that run across the face that we see when we raise the eyebrows or the smile lines, also known as crow's feet, that form when you smile and see the small lines that radiate at the corner. So right. a five minute Botox injection in those areas really does wonders to smooth the skin and make it look more youthful and give the skin a more beautiful and, and, help, and helpful um, appearance. And so how long does something, um, both in terms of dermal fillers and Botox, how, does, how long does something like that last? I imagine this is not a permanent fix most times. Correct. It's not a permanent fix. Uh, the average time for botulinum toxin uh, treatment for wrinkles to last is around three months. Mm -hmm. That can vary a little bit depending on where it's used. In very dynamic areas that tend to move a lot, like around the eye, as we blink and close our eyes every night while sleeping, the lifespan tends to be a little bit less around three months. And in other areas that there isn't as much movement day to day, it can last for as long as four or five months. Um, in terms of dermal filler, on the other hand, that varies based on the type of filler that's used. And in general, that can last for six to eight months in some cases, but there are dermal fillers that are meant to be more permanent and can last longer and need to be re-injected a lot less often. So although we always shoot for a treatment that will last for as long as possible, we also want to pick the correct treatment in the correct area to get a safe and natural looking result. And then if it's a matter of having that reapplied or retreated three months later or eight months later, most patients love the result enough and they've been through the first injection that any subsequent treatment that's needed is much easier for them to get through and they know what great result to expect and they're more willing to have it you know needed to be injected again right what are some other cosmetic procedures that have gained popularity since the pandemic started interestingly procedures that involve places where masks currently are covering the face have hmm. become very popular and i'll refer specifically to rhinoplasty or a surgery to change the outward shape of the nose. And I think the reason that that's grown in popularity is the fact that we wear masks and that can hide swelling or limited bruising that can occur after surgery. Even sutures that may need to stay in place for one week can be hidden by a mask and allow patients to actually recover in a much more private and smoother fashion than if they were expected to return to work or face the public, you know, day one after surgery. So things that we do such as rhinoplasty surgery almost allow patients a little bit of an easier time recovering because they know that they can cover the area with a mask temporarily. And then after they heal up, then they can go back to not wearing the mask and look and feel even better than before. So I would say rhinoplasty is another area where we've seen much interest in, and we're busier than ever in helping patients with those problems, partly because the downtime is improved by the fact that we expect to see people wearing masks and it covers up some of the immediate post-operative changes that are temporary. Speaking of some of the more aggressive surgical options, um, let's talk about facelifts. What's involved with a facelift surgery and what makes someone a good candidate for one? Good question. So we talked earlier a little bit about how inevitably we all lose some of the soft tissue volume of the face as we age. And we all tend to do that in a similar fashion. And what we tend mm -hmm. to see is the soft tissues of the face, like the soft tissues of the cheeks, with time and because of the effects of gravity, tend to move down. And they can accumulate over the jawline and create situations that have been uh, named jowling or turkey neck, which I personally don't like that name, but these are names that you'll read about or hear about. And what right. that does is it obscures the jawline 
it creates heaviness under the neck and it can detract from otherwise very beautiful features of a patient's face such as their eyes or such as their cheekbones and so when we perform facelift surgery what we're doing is we're restoring that soft tissue volume of the face and correcting some of the signs of aging that occur with time to restore it back to a more normal, a more youthful, a more healthy location. Um, and so facelift surgery, although it's done to improve the jaw contour and the mid face, is done through incisions that are hidden in natural areas of creases, like the crease in front of the ear or the area behind the ear in such a fashion that when those scars heal, they're practically invisible. And that lets us then work through limited incisions under the skin to restore a healthy appearance. And at the end of the day, after the healing process is over, it leaves behind scars that are practically invisible and achieve that natural, unoperated look that we shoot for. And we always say we want patients to hear from friends or family um, did you just have a great night's sleep? Did you just come back from vacation? Because you look better, but I can't tell why. And doing these kinds of things through the incisions and the techniques that we have really allow a natural result without somebody looking fake or looking um, unnatural in any way. And so it's a very, very good tool to restore self-confidence in somebody that maybe is observing these changes as they age with time. And how long does it take to recover from something from a facelift and what kind of help would someone need while they were recovering? Very, very good question. Um, recovery time can vary patient to patient. Almost right. everyone will have a week or two of slight swelling, um, perhaps bruising under the skin, which is temporary and which fades away. Um, the sutures that we use for surgery stay for one week and they're removed in the office a week later. However, in terms of the help that a patient might need as they recover, really that's something that we provide. Uh, the day after surgery, we have patients back into the office. We wash their hair with shampoo, which feels amazing. We check on all the incisions. We make sure everything looks perfectly clean. We may place a temporary facelift dressing, which is a wrap that eventually um, and essentially reduces swelling. And then we have them return to the office a week later to check again, and then maybe at two weeks. So in other words, there's very frequent follow-up and um, our whole office is dedicated to ensuring that if any questions arise, any issues or concerns, that somebody is able to evaluate the patient, that I am available to see the patient back in the office. Until they get past those first two weeks when much of the bruising and swelling and any discomfort is pretty much gone. And then at that point, the follow-up can be spaced out um, a little bit longer. So a whole team of people are there for the patient as they recover. There's very little need for family members or friends to be doing any of this at home. And we like it that way. We like mm -hmm. to monitor things and hearing it from us that everything's healing exactly the way we expect, you know, really does go a long way in terms of recovering from something like a facelift that certainly has a little bit more downtime than some of the injectable uh, techniques and procedures that we discussed earlier. So that's why we have our team available and, um, and help patients get through really the first two weeks of, of those minor issues. Right. Um, what are the risks and complications that are associated with a facelift? The risks in general for any surgery, whether you're having surgery on your big toe or surgery on your face, would include things like infection, Mm -hmm. would include things like bleeding after surgery or the buildup of blood under the skin. Um, fortunately, these are things that are very, very infrequent. These are things that if they do occur, because we follow patients closely um, in the immediate post-op period, can be identified, can be treated and corrected. So long-term issues that have a major effect, um, fortunately, we don't see. Um, scarring is one issue that can um, show up down the line and that's why we carefully screen patients prior to surgery. We make sure that their skincare regimen is optimized before surgery and if there's any factors in their medical history that might suggest they don't scar 
or they don't heal quite as well as we'd want them to, then we advise them closely about that. Um, now, that being said, scarring is something that we have the ability to improve greatly through um, techniques that we do in the office, such as microneedling or steroid injections or just very good scar fade cream. So a lot of those long-term issues can be mitigated by just careful observation as patients heal and recover. Um, but I would include that in the list of those general risks of having surgery that kind of exist no matter what. Um, we just take them way more seriously because this is the face that we're talking about and you can't conceal it or hide it like you could other areas. And so that's why we do everything we can to, to minimize and mitigate those risks. Right. And so we kind of talked about this a little bit before, but with all these different types of procedures, how can one expect their face to look over time once they've had these procedures um, or as they, as they continue to age, I suppose? Very, very good question. I think, first of all, it depends on the patient's desires because mm -hmm. some patients want to see a drastic change. Others want to see an improvement, but they still want to look like themselves. And so that comes up during our initial conversation. One of the first items we discuss is what goals does that particular patient have? Now, let's say a patient does want to see major change and they do want to see the change after surgery last them decades. Then in the case of something like a facelift, we expect a decade of improvement before time and gravity then changes things to the point where a revision might be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the other surgeries that we've discussed and other treatments, such as rhinoplasty, we really don't see any change after the initial period of healing occur. So when the surgery is done to um, improve contour and soft tissue changes with time, that's something that has a lifespan of a decade and may need a revision, depending on the patient's desires. But other surgeries, such as eyelid surgery or rhinoplasty, which is changing the shape of the nose, those are things that we tend not need not to need to rev revise as time goes on and can be more stable. Um, but again, it does come down to the patient's desires and their goals and how drastic of a difference do they want to see. And that's something that we take very seriously because um, everyone is different and everyone is looking for a different amount and a different degree of change. So we're, we come to the part of the interview where we're going to take some questions from the audience. One person asked, at what age would you start recommending that someone gets injectables? Is there like a minimum age or a time period where you think is best to start that some that point? That's a, I think that's a very personal, uh, personal decision for, for each patient. What I would encourage is anyone considering it should make an appointment to come in and sit down and talk about options. First and foremost, I will say with botulinum, injection, which again is that treatment that we perform to weaken and to lessen the contraction of muscle to smooth wrinkles, that there is a lot of good evidence that the earlier you do that, the more you can avoid the formation of wrinkles in the first place. So there is some preventative action of botulinum injections that would make any patient who understands the risks and understands kind of the goals of treatment, a very good candidate, and that might cut down on their need for future treatment. However, in terms of facial filler or dermal filler, usually those treatments are done in patients that have greater signs of aging because they might happen to be older. I would mm. say the exception is in the lips, which is an area that even younger patients often desire more volumization. And so that's an area that can be injected even in the mid-teenage years, depending on the motivations, the understanding of the patient. Um, but in general, younger patients would not be good candidates for facelift surgery or facial filler injected into other areas, as opposed to botulinum injections, which actually can have some advantages to doing that early. Interesting. I, I would have not known that. So taking something away with me today. Well, that's all the time we have today, but thank you, Dr. Smith, for taking the time to chat with us and share all this great information. You're and welcome. I want to thank everyone who watched and participated and shared their questions with us. 
Please make sure to visit rush.edu for more information about our plastic surgery services and stay tuned to more live broadcasts from Rush. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.